Alrighty, yo, what is going on everybody? It's your boy Mr. DDG94 You're back with another reaction video today. We finna react to Goosebumps scariest episode. Mm. I think I know what it is. And I must say, <laughs> you might be on the money with this one. I mean, Goosebumps does have a lot of other, you know, scary and they get into it like they scary episodes but like there was a lot of them were just like consequence like consequence based episodes like make the right decision type of episodes like don't abuse the power don't don't do this don't do that you know lessons you know life lessons you know what i'm saying that's what a lot of this 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 generation needs you need life lesson episodes but they don't want to make them no more they just want y'all to look at dumb shit on the internet I digress. But anyway, so without further ado, let's get right into it. Okay, so before we get into the episode, let's talk about our boy R.L. Stein. As someone who struggles greatly with dyslexia and memory retention, the accessible and simplistic nature of Stein's storytelling always made for comfortable reading material as a kid. Despite his legacy as the Stephen King of children's literature, Stein Facts. was never fundamentally a horror writer. As far as he was concerned, comedy was more his jam, and Goosebumps forged this perfect balance between his dry, sarcastic sense of humour and his creatively creepy concept. Concepts. So defining them precisely as scary is relatively disingenuous, even if they were still effective nonetheless. For example, the blob that ate everyone is about a boy trying to become a horror writer, and his story about a blob monster becomes real, and eventually the boy defeats it at the end. The twist, however, is that the book is written from the perspective of the blob, telling the story to another blob, who suggests making it a happy ending, prompting the story to change from the boy defeating the blob to having the blob eat everyone. It tells this genuinely creepy story, and cleverly twists it into something darkly comedic. But then you had books like It Came From Beneath The Sink, Stay Out Of The Basement and Ghost Beach, which had villains that were either ambiguous, abstract, minimalist or just plain ordinary. The horror felt grounded enough that, as a kid reading the book from the perspective of another kid, there was always a distinct feeling of vulnerability and insecurity, knowing that the simplest things could easily become so threatening. Of course, if you want to be a snob about it, there were several critics that referred to the series as sub-literature, which is an inferior style of writing reliant on basic predictable storytelling that prioritizes popular trends and ideas to reach as broad an audience as possible. But Stein believed rejecting the overtly serious moral themes and complexities of many other kids' books at the time actually made his work more successful because the emphasis was first and foremost always on being fun. Thank you. In my case, however, I related my own childhood experiences to that of the characters, and as a result, I put myself in their shoes, and it made the stories more profound and engaging as a result. Uh, well, sometimes. The Haunted Mask in particular struck a chord with me when such an innocuous idea of a mask that gets stuck on the wearer's face was visualised in the first television adaptation of the series. And just for the record, this television series was super faithful to the vast majority of the books, especially this one. The story follows Carly Beth, an innocent preteen who's a bit of a pushover that suffers from being scarable, which is eh, a cute way of calling her incredibly anxious and even borderline paranoid given how much she's bullied and pressured by her peers. To get revenge on her two tormentors, Chuck and Steve, she buys a grotesque mask to scare them, and in turn the mask begins to consume and latch itself onto her head and gradually takes control of her. You know, like you do. Early on, she's left feeling partially outcast, and it establishes the kind of low self-esteem that could easily spiral into dangerous self-hatred, so Carly Beth's hero's journey is effectively characterised by finding that self-love and respect she feels is missing. Catherine Long really sells the character of Carly Beth through quite a surprisingly emotional performance. I don't like being scared. I don't like being afraid, okay? It's okay. Maybe someday that's not how it feels. 
Retrospectively, as an adult, it's much more uncomfortable watching how psychologically fragile she is. There are these spontaneous shifts in her emotional state from crying and upset to lashing out in anger to a bizarre demented laughter as she tears up the costume that's established as representing cuteness and she responds to all her problems by wanting to be scary. Cute? Last thing I want to be on Halloween is cute. I want to be scary this time. It's only further accentuated by the creepy Carly Beth head statue that her mother makes that serves as a physical symbol of her identity and especially her love. Huh, oh yeah, and it moves, but that's okay because I wasn't looking to sleep tonight anyway. What I like about the smile is just how supremely subtle the expression is that foreshadows this otherworldly eeriness for the remainder of the episode. It doesn't happen until the end of the hypothetical first act, and nothing supernatural occurs again until the end of the second act, but the fact that the only real horror of the episode are small movements from inanimate objects reinforces how much impact subtlety has over elaborate scares. The fake outs like the bullies or her brother are much more dramatically presented with obvious build up and jump scares, but it contrasts with blink and you miss it moments of real horror that work because they're downplayed and catch you off guard. Watching this on on TV as a kid, I couldn't rewind to see if it was actually moving or if my eyes were just playing tricks on me, and it left me feeling desperately curious. When she gets to the store, there's already a sinister quality to its presentation that's easy to miss in the introduction. The first thing the characters notice is that the store appears seemingly from nowhere, and it's compounded by the fact that it sits isolated alone, giving it a supernatural impression. For Carly Beth, it's enticing as if its presence is trying to lure her in, so once she does enter, you immediately sense that danger through her oblivious innocence, the stalker camera movement, ah, and of course, the ungodly terrifying masks that litter the store. Yeah, sure, you have your zombies, werewolves, aliens and such, but what really grabs your attention are the more abstract and jarring looking ones that really only serve to partially soften the blow struck by the reveal of the unloved. These sons of bitches still petrify me. There's a very particular attention to detail that always seems to imply an individual story for each of them that were never told. It's the stark realistic human characteristics mixed with the deformities that allude to a transformation between human and monster. Before Carly Beth gets the mask, I was telling myself, ugh, imagine turning into one of those things, and what proceeded was a visualization of that very literal fear. I've talked about masks in several videos before because I love the mystique a mask can represent, but there is a compelling backstory to their existence that still doesn't overshadow their individual ambiguity. The shopkeeper created the masks to hide a physical abnormality that we don't see because his current face is also a mask going through the same transformation as the others, but this isn't revealed until part 2. Each mask he created became hideous until he realised they failed because they only changed his outer appearance and never the ugliness inside of him. In the book, it explains that the shopkeeper was injured in a chemical experiment and he clearly refers to the unloved not as masks, but as real faces. Which, realistically, makes this even more messed up. Ultimately, the masks reflect the personality of the wearer because things can only be hidden for so long before they're exposed, so to speak. I was like you. I did not love myself. I made these faces to hide behind them, to hide my faults. But the faults were inside me. That's what infected the faces, turned them into monsters. Something I love and hate about their presence is that it feels like they're always staring at you with intent. It's persistent. And the moment Carly Beth puts on the mask, the subtlety of the horror continues. As the episode progresses, the mask begins to gradually consume her. First, her voice changes. Why don't you change your voice like that? That was the scariest part. I don't know. But I like it. <laughs> then it becomes compressed around her head. Whoa. Then it's difficult to get it off. Ah. Beth, what is it? Come on, it won't come off. Really? Then the mouth begins to move organically. You're the only one who ever wanted them. The only one who ever loved them. No! No! I want it off! I want it off now! 
then it becomes slimy, and finally her eyes change entirely. They're not my eyes, Sabrina. My eyes don't look like that. Try to calm down, Holly Beth. Those aren't my eyes. Where are my eyes? Where am I? You're scaring me. And what's important is that it never overemphasizes any of this. The focus is always on how this sweet, innocent girl is lost to this mask. When Walter White becomes progressively villainous, this is greatly reflected in the visual presentation of Heisenberg because you no longer see the character you once knew. You're goddamn right. <laughs> With Carly Bath, it's entirely the same. You get completely absorbed by the image of the mask, and the character we know under the mask becomes an entirely different person. She's meaner, snarkier, and just antagonistic. In her aim to get revenge on her bullies, she just becomes the very monster these two bastards already were. What we know of Carly Beth is solely represented in the statue that she's basically holding hostage, and the visual of a hollow head on a pike creates this emotionally symbiotic idea that her dark side has completely taken over. In fact, she acknowledges the head as her old self and the monster as her new self, and in a way, the head ironically begins to feel more real the more evil she becomes. It looks so real, where'd you get it? Oh, it's me. It's who I used to be. Used to be. Forget it. Another effect of subtlety I only later noticed was how much it fluctuates between Carly Beth and the mask in control. Sometimes she's just playing about, while other times she starts referring to herself in the third person in a seemingly indirect way as the creepy voice becomes more fluent. How are you making that weird voice? Apologize to her. Tell Carly Beth your story. Apologize? For what? For what? And it just gets worse when the statue starts to become remnants of the old Carly Beth. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> Talk. It's interesting how the performance is so radically different both physically and vocally at this point that I even started to doubt if it was the same actress under the mask. When she buries the head, I guess it's supposed to signify the death and burial of Carly Beth, suggesting the mask is in full control, but given it's a story about finding self-identity, the real Carly Beth still shines through when her friend reunites and cares for her safety, almost as if to imply good events counteract the power of the mask. However, this comes with the reveal that the mask has totally consumed her because the lining of the mask is now gone, and the exacerbating stress of the ordeal just makes you feel somewhat helpless. She returns to the shopkeeper desperately trying to get the mask off, prompting his rather poignant speech I showed earlier, and naturally, this happens. Oh, <laughs> awaken them. What's happening? Now, we've come a long way in 22 years of visual effects since this episode has broadcasted, but even today, this is super terrifying to watch. It's not just the abstract way it's presented through motion blur ghosting effects, it's more so the idea of what will happen to her if they catch her, because I always seem to get this image of her being forcefully decapitated like the statue she buried. It's never suggested what will happen, but associating her statue with the mask always seemed to inadvertently allude to an outcome I'm glad I don't see. About to say, bitch, run, run, it's bitch, the way run. It's free and from her perspective. They're just floating aggressively towards the screen, and the closer they get, the more they become. I have this immense stimulant fear of flat composition where something moves straight towards the camera. It's just a massive visual trigger for me that even works in small examples like It Follows, The Grudge, or The Idol Twins in The Shining. Admittedly, the story races itself to the ending without justifying how she knew uncovering the head as the symbol of love would ward off evil, but it still has a profound impact with the central theme of her character. She now embraces her true self and realizes what she needs in life, and there is an incredible sense of relief given how intense and grimly confrontational those last few minutes are. The symbol of love. That's what he meant. 
I still find this surprisingly emotional as a conclusion. It sees her character go through so much self-loathing and social pressure, only to face something even more horrific and life-threatening, and her ability to overcome this in the final moments really emphasize how much she's grown and matured throughout the story in small but very meaningful ways. Oh yeah, that's right, there was a second two-parter released the following year. Let's see what the crack is with that. <gasps> it's just as I feared, isn't it? Yes. Halloween has brought you back. Yes. I will stop you. Oh god damn it. All right, I only have vague memories of this one, so I'll keep it brief. It's an absolutely unsubtle dud in comparison. It's nowhere near as profound or distinctly memorable, and the main character this time is just one of those dickhead bullies from the first one. Shut up. You can't make me immediately sympathize with this kid with virtually little character development. And don't play the whole, oh, he's just a little prankster. No, he's a bully. And I don't honestly buy the idea that he's a friend of Carly Beth because he never shows any honest sincerity towards her. Mean Creek made me sympathize with a bully. But this one... Huh? I heard someone. Yeah, well, you know, you're supposed to knock first. I did. Well, you're supposed to wait until I say come in. Don't have any rights around here? Ugh, go on, mom. Nigga, you don't pay no motherfucking bills up in here, cuz you better chill the fuck out for you get knocked the fuck out, man. Who you think you is, cuz? You don't pay no motherfucking bills in this goddamn house be telling people, uh, <laughs> shouldn't you knock first? See, see, that's that white kid shit. Black kids, we get knocked the fuck out. <laughs> man, shut your bitch ass up, nigga. Nobody asked you about a bitch ass thing. You better shut the fuck up or I knock your fucking head off your shoulders, don't think like a bitch. That's exactly what will happen. That's that's the last words you'll hear saying some shit like this. I'm punch him in the face. So, this time the unloved have been destroyed, and the new mask Steve gets basically makes him older to the point of near killing him. And the whole time I thought to myself, what if the twist is that we get a repeat of that scene from Halloween 3, Season of the Witch? You know what I'm talking about. Granted, he overcomes the evil by selflessly protecting Carly Beth, which results in this response. When you threw yourself in front of the haunted mask, that was a symbol of love. Okay, I will give the episode credit for having a revelation that Steve does have an inner good to him, and I appreciate that, but then it treats him so overtly as the hero, and he's just a smug prick about it. I was trapped within the mask. This boy freed me. And saved you. Well, I didn't want her to get hurt. Didn't seem fair, you know? Boy, I really have a dislike for this kid, but maybe it's because I like this nugget of ambiguity in the first one that just doesn't exist in the second one, and the whole bad guy to good guy arc was better handled in Chillology with that creepy Carl guy. Yeah, remember that one? I love that Carly Beth's character growth is very present here, and she goes out of her way to be the wise person to help Steve, but the entire two-parter is a slog that tries to recapture the same transformation as the first one, but without the ominous mystique. <laughs> So, to conclude, this is by far one of the most compelling episodes of television for me, even today, and it's rather astonishing that it holds up well thanks to the quality of its production values. It oozes atmosphere, and it established a strong foundation for the series moving forward. I could totally look at several other episodes if the interest is there, but if I was to try and end on some profound statement, it would be how important a personal symbiotic connection can be to a horror story like this, especially for children. Carly Beth is a conflicted character whose personal struggles are challenged by the core horror elements of the story. And I think for a kid growing up surrounded by various contrasting and conflicting personalities and behaviours, this episode has a unique way of saying that finding your true identity takes challenge and hardship so you can face your biggest fears and adversaries with bravery. Boy, this is, uh, this is a little too deep for me. A wading pool is too deep for you, Chuck. 
The underlying appreciation I take away is not just the effect of unknowingness horror gives to our imagination and outward curiosity, but that at its core, it still provides meaningful insight without ever having to stop and patronize the audience. Goosebumps just tells its story, and it kept me awake at night, wondering about life. Well, okay, maybe it had more to do with the fact it scared the shit out of me. <coughs> Hi folks, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please leave your Alrighty. Um I didn't I never really thought this was the scariest one. I always thought the scariest one was either the basement one or one of the dummy episodes. One of them, not all of them. Some of them was like, eh. And the rest of them was like, oh. There was a couple of ghost town episodes too that I I, I really was like, you <laughs> turn the channel away, please. <laughs> that was just back in the day though. I I can't really think of any Goosebumps episodes off the top of my head. Cuz it's been so long. I haven't watched Goosebumps since uh I want to say 2005. That was the last time I saw a Goosebumps episode cuz I remember schools used to get uh Goosebumps uh videotapes and shit like that and every Halloween we would watch like Goosebumps episodes. And 2005 was the last time I watched a Goosebumps episode. After that, I've, I've never seen Goosebumps ever since. So my memory is like just right now when it comes to Goosebumps because I didn't watch it like that. I was I was too afraid to watch it, but I sit through them if we was in class together. Cause it was funny to watch them in class. Then <laughs> even though they used to come on early in the morning during the, <laughs> but <laughs> hey, they used to come on early in the morning on Fox Kids. But still though, you know what I'm saying? It was like. Nigga, nigga, I'm like, nigga, I'm like four, five, six years old. Of course, I'm gonna be scared. But anyway, so that's just gonna about do it for this one, man. I'll see y'all in the next video. Till then, peace out.